Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the Sunset Safari on a magnificent Sunday afternoon here in the Kruger National Park of beautiful South Africa. We are looking at a yellow-billed hornbill, and you are on a live safari. My name is James Henry. On camera today is Jean Dre. Hello, Jean Dre. Hello, James. Jean Dre, you seem to be sporting a sort of golf shirt. I bet he can't swing a golf club. Have you ever swung a golf club before? There we go. Uh, and like I say, a live safari, which means we'd very much like you to talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting, like that hornbill that you're looking at over there, which goes... And questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Otherwise, the YouTube chat stream works exceptionally well. Ask us questions about what we're seeing, make some comments if you like, and ask us about Africa and South Africa in general especially if you're thinking about traveling here. A lot of misconceptions about Africa, the dangers that you would face if you came here. We've had questions about um, what do you eat? Will it be possible for me to eat normal food in Africa? So if you have any questions about uh, Africa and South Africa in general, please don't be afraid to ask them. There are no stupid questions, plenty of stupid answers, as I've said before. And so just fire away with those. In the final control this afternoon, we have uh, Geraldine Kent. She is being ably assisted by Louise Pavid. And then on the other vehicle, the inimitable and highly enthusiastic Brent Leo Smith is heading off to the eastern side of the reserve, and I'll let you him tell you what he's going to do. Our plan today, now that this hornbill has ceased eating the termite alates that were coming out of this mound, is to go up north towards the Sydney's Dam, which is on the border, our northern border, because we saw a leopard there when we were on foot today. We were doing a tracking evaluation, which was marvellous fun, and we saw a leopard on foot there. A leopard, I'm not sure who she was, um, and so let's go and see if we can't pick her up and find her and, and identify her. That's the general plan. You're most welcome. It's good to have you along on what, I, like I say, is a magnificent Sunday afternoon. 30 degrees, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Blur Gahil on YouTube. Um, I'm a bit confused by your question. I want to know what is going to happen. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, and that's the beauty of what we do out here, is that anything could appear from anywhere. We are in an 8 million hectare or 8 million acre wildlife area. Uh, we're only allowed to traverse about 1,500 hectares or 4,000 on the western fringes of it. But this enormous wilderness area goes from South Africa, east into Mozambique, and north into Zimbabwe. And an enormous area home as they please and so we might see some lions around the corner we might see some elephants we might pop by the lip today and so anything at all could happen while we're out here now sometimes nothing happens which makes for a slightly awkward experience uh, but that's okay and like i say it's such a lovely afternoon simply because it's it's not too hot it's very pleasantly warm uh, the moisture that has came out of the sky has blessed us with a, a green sheen over the vegetation above us a couple of floaty relaxing sunday afternoon clouds float and uh, so it's got a wonderful feeling about it i'm feeling very unrushed by life at the moment and i think that's a good place from which to start a safari there is a there, there. Hmm. Hello, Mike in Florida. You would like to go to the hyena den. Well, Mike, um, I think that's a good idea. Just a little bit later. There, genre, can you see them? Are you able to pick them up with a camera? Yeah. There are the leopard tracks there. I'm going to try a little trick here. No. Didn't work. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll explain to you what I tried to do there. It was an utter failure. That's a female leopard who was going up the road here, and I wonder. She could well have be the same one that we saw earlier, having cut off uh, towards the dam, and then we saw her. But I don't know. This is. Mm, we're right in the kind of on the 
borders between Karula and Shadow's territories. Now, for those of you who are new viewers, um, the two main leopards that we see here, the two main females, are a 13-year-old, or soon-to-be 13-year-old female called Karula. I think it's 13. She's about to turn 12. No, she's about, sorry, she's about to turn 12. T soon to be 12 year old female leopard and she's uh, normally sort of off in the east that's where Brent's going today and then her daughter Shadow who is nine years old and she's over here around this area and then west into Arethusa and we have or well, they have both got cubs at the moment we're not allowed to see the cubs because they're a little bit small still for us to be viewing in the vehicle but it is very exciting times and for them to be here where I am given how far away the dens are with the cubs, I think is strange. So while that may have been Shadow, I wonder if it isn't the female that we saw today, and I don't know who she was. Anyway, time will tell. As Brent says, it could have been Karula. She does move an enormous distance when she's hunting. It could have been Shadow. She's not too far. Well, I mean, she's quite a long way to the west, but I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll see. Ah, now Indiana Jane, before we came live, we were watching that hornbill feed, and you want to know what its preferred food is. Indiana Jane is preferred food, actually, we were reading about. I know that they eat, they, well, they, they basically will eat anything meaty that is smaller than them and sometimes even young leaves and fruits. But they'll eat snakes, they'll eat chameleons, they will eat small mammals if they can get hold of them, they will eat uh, termites, they'll eat spiders, they'll eat ants, and they'll eat fruits and a few young leaves as well. So that's what they eat, a very Catholic diet. But while those termite allates are coming out, remember the ground is now soft, and so the termites are releasing those royal flying termites into the air, and while that's happening, uh, the hornbills will take advantage because they're extremely good sources of protein and fat, which are both wonderfully, uh, both often quite short around here. And so they'll take advantage, lots of animals will be taking advantage of the termites, even though they wouldn't necessarily normally eat them. Now, I think what we're going to do is go up this way because when we saw the leopard, she was just down that road there and then she came off basically to the west and north towards the water. So we'll see you at the water, and while we get there, let's go across to Brent Leo Smith and see what he's doing. He'll keep you updated, and I'll see you just now. Good afternoon, and welcome to this spectacularly beautiful uh, late summer's evening here in Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Vim on camera with me today, and we've just seen something I know a lot of you ask about, and we didn't want to go any closer in case we chase them away. I wonder who can guess what we've seen, and it's something I don't think, I think I've only managed to put on camera once since I've been at Safari Live. So let's see if we can catch up with this mysterious and elusive animal. Well, are you ready for quick camera work? Uh, we're gonna have to be quite fast. Uh, they don't like to hang around. Really hoping they haven't gone too far. I don't think so. They were all around this area a little bit earlier. Quite a few of them. I'm guessing they're probably just around this bend. Where are they now? Where are they? Have they done a disappearing act on us? No. I heard them talking while we were waiting. Mm. They make funny little... Mm. 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 Hear them discussing amongst themselves. Where could they have gone? Vim, did you chase them away? Uh, no, I was quiet. Yes, Vim was quiet. I was quiet. Tracks are still on the road. That's a good sign. Maybe 
Maybe they just moved a bit faster than we thought. There's one there then. I think it's one, or is that a termite mound? Is that a termite mound? It's a termite mound. Ah! <laughs> was a, a big male something or whatnot sitting with his back to us. Oh, no tracks. Maybe they went down towards the Mawati. We're just going to check this open area and then we're going to head back carry on in search of these mystery beasties. Well, we've got the first guest through from Rocky Knight saying, is it wildebeest? It most definitely is not. I think they've ducked down that way. What do you think, fam? Well, we seem to have a, a telepath out there in the audience uh, who's guessed it spot on correctly. There's a big troop of baboons we saw from a distance uh, and they didn't look very relaxed, so we stayed away till uh, we were live to see if we could find them. Oh, oh, and, oh, oh excuse me. <laughs> so last track's there. We're heading down there, so a big troop of Chakma baboons. The last baboon I saw was being eaten by a leopard. Okay, we've got... A little water, uh, yeah, more yeah, little, a big, big water back. There we go. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to try see if I can hear the baboons. Amazing, there must have been 20 or 30 of them and they've just vanished. Let's check down towards the Mawati Creek bed. I'm gonna look here. Never in my, my days did I think I would be actively tracking baboons. Yeah, we're back on the tracks. Ooh. What was that? It looks like these baboons have vanished. I'm going to do another bigger loop around, see if we might pick them up. Uh, but while we do that, we are also checking uh, in around where we lost Karula to see if she maybe popped up on the road. And we know we've got a really good alarm system somewhere in this area because if those baboons see Karula, we'll get to hear that wonderful bark of theirs. That, and they definitely speak to each other. And one will go, Leopard! The other one will go, Wah! Leopard! But it doesn't quite sound like that. It sounds more like wow, 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 wow. No baboon tracks coming down this far. And Simon in Titsukama on the east coast of South Africa. 
Hi, Simon. Simon says it's very strange that the baboons are so scarce here. Uh, they have forests around there. Sorry, the spider web that was getting in my So, Simon, we will get back to discussing why there are not so many baboons, but before we do that, James has got a new addition to the Juma family. Look, everyone, it's a little water buck. I know you've just had one with Brent, but possibly not one this tiny. It looks like I've always been struck by how donkey-like the little ones look. So sweet. I think that cannot be more than maybe a week old. Maybe two. Isn't it delightful? And it is so small, um, I'm just trying to give you an idea of the height. I mean, she probably stands about four feet at the shoulder, and so he probably stands about mm, maybe one and a half feet at the shoulder, maybe two feet, two feet at the shoulder. So he's tiny, tiny. I say he simply because it's too awkward to say it. Could easily be a little female. Very upright head. Yeah, it's very good posture. Looks like it could be a ballet dancing water buck, that one. Hmm. It's like Jamie. Hmm. Very nice gait. Perhaps a dressage water buck. We've come to Sydney's dam now, everybody, and Jamie, just behind us... Uh, just behind us is the dam, or behind where you are looking is the dam, and we're just uh, trying to find... Sorry, I'm just... The radio is going ballistic now in my hand. Just quickly listening to it. Yeah, good afternoon, Andrew. Sorry, let me just turn it down. It's now becoming too busy. And we didn't find any tracks of the leopard, and so I think we'll just continue around here. We'll have a quick squiz and then see what else we can find. The block in which these waterbuck are and into which the leopard went, of course, is very, very thick indeed. And so we're not going to just kind of drive in there. And she was quite nervous. Oh. Welcome back. We haven't managed to relocate on those oh, baboons yet, and thanks. apologies for James's gremlins. Let me just turn that down. So we are actually bypassing the area of Karula's first den, uh, where we first saw that tiny glimpse of a minute less than 12 hour old baby leopard that was just down here and she is leopards will sometimes uh, later on uh, when the cubs are a bit older utilize the same den sites again i don't think that's the case at the moment we just happened to be meandering down here because the baboon tracks were heading in this general direction so simon we're chatting why we don't seem to have that many baboons here now, the main reason would be in this particular area is food. So in and around Tsitsikama, where there's a lot of people, people are very messy, so there's quite a lot of leftovers and food that they can scavenge, which creates monster troops. Where there is here, we don't have that big, a big river system. We only have a little Morwati, uh, which is a little dry river system. So there are not very many big uh, jackalberries and scotias and other ideal trees for them to roost in, uh, as well as feed off. So they do. You might see more of them as they have to go further and further in search of food. There's that. He's right in that thicket. You got him there, Vim? No, he's, he's just through there. Okay, unfortunately.
Okay, so I think we're both in slight areas. Anyway, we've moved away from the awkward area, I hope, and we've come down a road called Sandy Patch, uh, which is un... well, named for the Sandy Patch that is around us, a sodic area, soil full of sodium ions, which makes them very rich grasses, very good for grazing, not so... I'm going to park of a tree that likes to grow sodic area. This one doesn't appear to have any fruits on it at all. It must be a male tree. Now they've just started to come into fruit and the fruit is, oh look it's not delicious, I shan't tell you a lie, but on a scale of most of the things out here that you can put in your mouth without dying, it's a pretty decent meal. Obviously not this particular one. I'll try and find you some. They're not quite ripe. They're just being off ripe at the moment. Now the leopard went in here somewhere. So we're just going to drive slowly around the block. If we don't pick up anything, well, then that's fine. And we'll go and see what else we can find. And Mike, we will go to the hyena den. Um, I will try and get there sort of, I think, probably around quarter to six, maybe six o'clock, so that we've got 20 minutes left before sunset. And that's quite a good time to be there. You don't want to go there too early. I don't think they'll be doing anything at this time of the day. So we'll keep looking out for tracks. And I had an amazing experience this morning. I was out with Renia Tenjana and Tlongo, who I spoke about yesterday. Um, an old tracking friend and possibly, and I say this uh, without reservation, probably one of the world's, if not the world's, premier tracker. And he took me tracking some lions today, and we walked all through this area. And he was, <laughs> it was just unbelievable. I could see them when they were on the road in some wet soil. Then I could see where they were. Picking out little spots where the lions were. This is horrendous. Okay, I think we're back, everyone. Sorry about that. So this is round about where the leopard was last seen, or last heard. We last heard some guinea fowl alarm calling round here. So I'm just gonna have a quick squiz through here. I might have a little troll in there on foot at some stage. Renius took me tracking. And he was a magician. It was unbelievable to watch the way he was able to see tracks in ground that, I mean, I just couldn't see what he was looking at. And as soon as we came across some soft ground, sure enough, there they were. And he'd keep going and keep going. And the speed with which he saw the tracks was phenomenal. And I'd forgotten. It's been a long time since I've worked with a really good tracker. And it is just a skill that takes decades and decades to try and hone and master and of course their skills are becoming less and less I guess appreciated and less and less needed in the days of radio collaring and uh, telemetry and that sort of thing but quite apart from the sort of biological necessity of having it it's um there's definitely a spiritual element to it where the connection to the wilderness is through tracking becomes that much deeper and so I think it still has an extremely important role to play um, in our human relationship with the earth. And he gave me, he told me about a trip to the United States that they did. And they went, I think they were somewhere around Yellowstone National Park with a, with a tracking group. And the guy said to him, well, you know, I've been tracking bears for 15 years and I've never seen one on foot before. So Renia said, well, show me a track. So they showed him a track of this thing and Renia wandered up and down a bit and he said, okay, I'll find it for you. And in four hours, he trailed this thing. He followed it, track for track. He followed it up into the mountains, and they found it eating berries out of a tree. And they, they were, three or four of the crew that they were with were in tears. They couldn't believe that somebody was able to do this, and that they had been trying for 15 years to try and find bears on foot. They'd obviously seen them, but they'd never tracked them on foot before. And here was this African from rural Gazankulu, round right where we are now. He lives just outside the gate here. And he went and he tracked a bear in four hours. Most wonderful experience for everybody concerned. 
Right, let's go back to Brent. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on foot in this block and see if I can't find the leopard. And then we're going to leave the area and see what else we can see. See you just now. Oh, no, we're not going back to Brent. Wendy is black screen. There is a bird. Not any bird, of course. The crowned lapwing. So named for its very obvious crown. And its lovely pink legs. Now, the interesting thing about the crowned lapwing and all of the coursing birds, so birds that run after their prey on the ground, is that they don't have a hind toe. They've got three forward-facing toes and no hind toe, like most of what we call the passerines or perching or singing birds. And that just helps them to run. It means they can run much faster and unhindered without the hind toe. Lovely bird. And there, what a wonderful Afrikaans name, which is like so many of the kind of local names out here. It's onomatopoeic, so it's named for the call that the bird makes. And you heard it there saying, give it, give it, something like that. And that's what the Afrikaans word is for that bird, a kivit. <laughs> Hello, Diane, on Twitter, you say, did James just say he was going to have a quick squiz? What does that mean? Um, Diane, it, it means a quick look, um, a sort of general overview. Uh, genre, do you know the term squiz? Yeah, genre knows it. It must be a, it must be a, it's either a South Africanism or a Britishism. It's probably an Englishism. Um, and so, so that's what it means, Diane, a squiz. I don't know where it comes from, what on earth the etymology of the word squiz is. Let's go down this road while we're waiting for Wendy to come back up. See if there aren't. There was a lovely zebra herd around here a bit earlier, so maybe we can find them. We will, of course, at some stage, one of us will go to those corpulent lions on the southern boundary. Or we just know that they're going to be lying down doing absolutely nothing right now. So we thought, while well, we've got a bit of light, let's go out and see what else we can find before we head down to those lions. The Styx lionesses, with whom Jamie spent, I think, probably about three hours this morning having found them. Hello, Eric Moore. I might have to hand your question across to, to one of our other viewers. You want to know how the Styx Pride got its name? Well, I mean, from the Styx River, but the Styx River, of course, doesn't occur here. It occurs in, um, in the, uh, the, the after, afterlife. And why they are called the Styx Pride, I, I'm not sure. But that's it's after the Styx River. And maybe the... Uh, I, mean, I, really, I don't know, Eric. I'm not sure why they're called the Styx Pride. It's quite a nice name, though. Styx pride, very really kind of mysterious. But um, they're an old pride, very old pride. I mean, they've been around for, for at least 10 or 15 years, and obviously not the same as they are now. Their membership has changed substantially, as has the Inkahuma prides, of course, which started off as 22 lions in the Manuleti, and it'll go back up to those numbers, and then very seldom will the pride completely disappear. That will be very unusual but it does happen from time to time. Not a lot of animals out here today, are there, Jean-André? No. Our tracking course is not, uh, not bearing great fruits at, the, at this point. Hello, Simon on Twitter. You want to know if we could perhaps do a vlog with Renius at some stage? Yes, I believe we probably could do a vlog with Renius at some stage. He's not here now, but he may well come back at some stage. 
there was a squirrel there, and like all of the other animals out here, it is hiding from us now. Beastly rodent. There are also some dwarf mongoose, which I can hear alarming. They're so far away. There are, of course, going to be now be lots of lovely wild flowers. Now I know Brent is very good with his wild flowers, but there have been a couple already as a result of the rain that have burst out of the ground. I'm very excited to finally have some moisture. And you'll find that a lot of the annual flowers will grow extremely quickly. As soon as conditions are favorable, and while there's still some day length and some heat, they will leap out of the ground, produce more seeds, and then disappear back into the ground. And that is the way of things with an annual. Mm. Really a profound amount of uh, activity out here this afternoon. Like I say, about 30 degrees Celsius, 85 Fahrenheit, so not very, not very hot, very pleasant. And there's something quite interesting. Sorry, jean I parked you on a slope there. That wasn't very nice of me at all. Stand by, everyone. I just want to get out and show you something. Here, we have mushrooms. I'm going to pick a few because they're going to be run over anyway. Hmm? You can't see them. I'm bringing them to you, jean -Dre. Now, I asked Renius about whether these were edible or not. He said some and some not. Obviously, with a mushroom, one doesn't just stick one in one's mouth and see what it tastes like, because one is either going to hallucinate fantastically or die or just have a nice meal. Uh, and you cannot tell which that will be. But these are magnificent little kind of roundish mushrooms. Um, more about their biology, I cannot tell you. But let's open one up and see what it looks like. Ah, not unlike dung. <laughs> but it isn't dung. I promise you it is actually a mushroom that was growing out of the ground. <laughs> and in that fleshy bit there will be the spores, which will travel eventually when this mushroom desiccates. They will travel on the wind, settle in the ground, and when the water comes again, they should explode forth like this dung-shaped mushroom. You do believe me that it's a mushroom, don't you, Jean-Dre? No. You think it's dung, do you? <laughs> For a horrifying moment there, I thought it might be some uh, unredigested scrub hair dung, because scrub hair make a white pellet like that, and they eat it straight out, straight as it comes out. And then it comes out much harder the second time round. And, but it isn't. That is definitely a mushroom, because I had to pull it out of the ground. <laughs> Okay, on we go. Yeah. All righty, Brenty is back online with a nice surprise. So I was actually making my way back to try to find some baboon tracks, and we found a wonderful big herd of eddies. And they're on a mission. They're all single filing through the bush. I think there's, I guess there's probably about 40 of them in total. Spectacular, splish, splashing, throwing mud all over the place. You just see them moving, just all of them, very, very definitely moving in a, a single direction. Any more coming from that side? There are still some more laggers, but we're going to try to get ahead of the main bunch. We've been so, so treated with elephants over the last while in having the most spectacular sightings. And definitely one of the animals I love spending time with. We don't worry, we're not leaving those elephants. I'm just going to pop around to the other side of them. The 
one thing about having lots and lots of elephants is you have lots and lots of landscaping done and sometimes deposited in the road. Very messy with their takeaways. Just leave them littered about. So just for those who are wondering, this is where we lost Karula probably about 100 meters from here uh, on the Sunrise Safari. Maybe she's made her way towards the same water hole the elephants are going. We'll see if there's any tracks there shortly. Come on, ladies. I should be... Ah, there they are, moving through. Let's see if we can pick the line correctly where they're going to pop out. This is the spot. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, let's go. I can just see one through the bush over there. The others are still moving. Oh, what's it? Oh, it's chased the diker. Oh, I got I got very excited for a second. I thought the elephants might have done our leopard tracking for us. That does happen from time to time. Of course, if you're a a leopard you don't want to be around when a big breeding herd like this is coming through they will chase you look at this they're slowly coming it's amazing how these massive animals can move so quietly Having a snack while on the move. Just see the tree shaking vigorously there in the background. Oh. I think I've misjudged my line slightly. Needs to be probably about 40 meters further. because I'm keeping the sun on the right side of the car. There they come. Look at that in a big straight line. Showing a little bit of unease just in her body language. I can see she's a little bit tense. So I'm happy for her to go wide like that and not directly next to us. Oh, look at that poor little one up behind her. It was obviously in the wrong position when it was uh, time for the constitutional. And it's got a spot on its head where another elephant has done a dropping on, on top of it. Oh, look, there's very unusual tusks on this female coming through. Not quite as recurved as Fang. Oh, hello, little monster. They are heading straight towards that mud wallow. Hot day. Been feeding and moving around. Probably really looking forward to getting involved in that mud. Some big girls in this group. Wasn't that amazing? So now they're coming in that straight line. 
And when elephants want to go somewhere with purpose, they really do. Oh, someone's stopping for a snack. See, one of the really amazing things about elephants, they'll remove all that moribund and dead vegetation to get to the nice green grass that's coming through from underneath. Listen to that. Having a chat. See those big. Oh, there we go, talking again. You can see those wonderful big ears hard at work cooling down the elephant's body. Oh, there's even more elephants coming in behind. Lots and lots of babies. vegetation get to that nice green grass yum yum you can see that now very few other animals would have access to that but so even though they might not eat it all uh, they will open it up so other species might have a chance to feed on it as well why elephants are so important and keystone species in the ecosystem. Not only do they change the ecosystem, they grant other species access to food that they might not have always had access to by pushing down trees, by moving dead trees. Oh, listen to that. Very talkative lady. Now, a lot of an elephant's communication Oh, incoming bully. Look who we got. Oh, we got a little visitor. Isn't he just too sweet? So, Marlo uh, is wondering whether the elephant that kept visiting Jamie and my backyard has been seen again uh, since the rain. He hasn't. He's made himself quite scarce since then. And obviously there's enough food outside of our backyard, so no need to come destroy any more of our swimming pool deck. But it was quite a thing to wake up in the morning and have a, an elephant outside your window. I quite liked it. Um, the swimming pool deck didn't. Look at her go. I'm just going to try and move a little bit so we can see a bit more of what she's up to. So quite important. Watching the body language here is not to drive directly at an animal. Fortunately, I had to do it for a couple of centimeters there just so we can turn around. You want to drive angles away from them as far as threatening. There you go. Hello, little monster. Yes. Oh, very cute. And this is the female with the short trunk. I didn't even recognize her. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the same one or maybe even a different one. It's a different one. It's a very, ang a very sharp angle cut off on the trunk. So that's a different female with the short trunk from the one we normally see. Don't you think, Phil? Um, yeah, it looks a bit different. It looks a bit different. It looks like there's a different angle. But we're going to move around. I think the rest of the herd might have got to the 
little mud wallow. I'm hoping they don't just bypass it and, and go have a swim there. So Milo's got a very interesting question about elephants and it's very, very pertinent, especially since we are seeing so many elephants at the moment. Sorry, Elaine in Michigan. And this is our all the different elephant herds as relaxed as each other with vehicles and Elaine most definitely not especially now we're getting a lot of elephants that are coming through from Western Kruger where there are no tourist roads so they're not used to vehicles so it's always very important uh, and how you approach an elephant and how to read its body language so Immediately earlier, we could see that one female wasn't quite nearly as relaxed as, the, as that short trunked one we've just been with. So she immediately changed the angle. Her, her body just stiffened ever so slightly. So we decided we would leave her and give her a bit of space. You can see that the rest of the eddies in here, that mud wallow is coming up. Now, whether they just keep moving past it, maybe they're on their way to Buffalo's Hook Waterhole. Wouldn't that be spectacular? Nice big herd of elephants playing in the mud. Or they could be just going to play in this little mud wallow, but I don't think so. Looks like they might just march past. Maybe they'll chase Karula out for us. might not be enjoying this particular mud wallow at the moment, but someone else is. Hello, misters. You look quite happy, quite comfortable there, enjoying that. No need to stand up on our account. And Elaine, this will go through to Buffalo as well. We'll be seeing buffalo that have come through from areas where there's not a lot of people, especially bigger herds. So they might also might not be as relaxed as some of the herds we're used to. Hello, big boy. Those elephants, I think, are going to pass behind into a little creek system there. But Vim, I've just spotted an animal which is very difficult to get on camera. Shall we go for it? Okay, let's try. The little slender mongoose just crossed the road into this little thicket chat. So we're gonna go forward slightly. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm not looking, I'm just trying to make sure we don't miss when he scuttles. of that weeping wattle. Just a little bit to the left. I thought I saw his head pop through one of those holes. Nope. Mm -mm. Maybe he's on the other side of it. Let's have a look. So exciting. Incredible little carnivores. Also incredibly fast. Might even just have a hole here that he's popped down into. No, that it disappearing act. So I think those elephants are going to keep marching through towards Buffalo's Hook. So I think we, what we'll try to do is get there just before them. And Hopefully they will come through there. Also, I had been planning on checking this area quite extensively uh, to see if Kurula pops out and heads towards one of her old favorite old haunts, uh, the Buffalo's Hook Water Hole.
So while we make our way towards Bustle's Hook waterhole, hopefully we'll arrive in good time to catch the eddies there. Uh, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. Everyone, I've done a sort of loop through there on foot. We came back into the area where we saw the leopard this morning, and I'm afraid I found not sight, not hide, nor hair of her. So we're leaving the area now. We're going to go off further to the west, at least east. I cannot ever get that east. I have to correct myself. And what we're going to do then is head probably down towards Juma Dam and see if anything is coming down to drink there now. We have managed to sort down down out here at the stage. So here come the ellies, but we're going to keep ahead of them. Oh no, those ellies look wet, like they found some mud to play with in the drainage line. I actually think this is a different herd of ellies to the one we were following. Oh, listen to that. They still are also heading in the general direction of a Buffalo's Hook, so we're going to do the same. Maybe we can beat them there. So, it's very, very incredibly thick. to Karula this morning on the other side of this little creek. Can't call it a dry creek because obviously there's some pools that the elephants managed to find in it. check very carefully around here uh, and this is a favorite sort of haunt of critters to come through down through here and then up towards the buffalo's hook water hole Onto that bush. Go right, we'll go for the little crumbeck first. Go keep going. Oh, there he goes. Okay. Now go to the left. And straight into that same bush again. A little bit to the right. Oh, he's flown away now as well. Um, he's a little cysticular. He's quite unhappy about something. Could be below in that little river system. Okay, Vim. Go straight across to the opposite bank and come down a little bit. Oh, it flew there now. It's up in that tree. It's a bit far for you guys to see now. There he is, bottom left of corner uh, of, of shot. Now this is a, a good test for the the bird is out there. Where did I put my binoculars now? Oh, he's disappeared. I'm going to see if I can get a photograph and show you that way. I think that's probably going to be the best way. Oh, of course he flew. And I have a picture, a wonderfully beautiful picture of an empty branch. So that's where the bird was. Um, it, was a, it was a greater honey guide that was sitting there, but it did manage to escape. Sorry about that. Can you see a leopard in there, Jim? I don't think so. Maybe that's maybe a mongoose. 
Okay, well, it's all. Always worthwhile checking all these little things. on Karula's territory or vice versa, there is a possibility that they would fight. But unlikely. So we're going to speed up a little bit and try and get around to the Bufflesock waterhole before those alleys. While we do that, let's go jump on with James, who's got a Hallison creature for you. Now, we are not moving at the moment, so with any luck, we will be perfectly within signal range. There is a stunning woodland kingfisher and they've stopped their singing. Not completely, but they've definitely become slightly more silent, I think, as they plan to go ahead, at least to go off back overseas, back sort of north into equatorial Africa. And what is so lovely about this little scene, if Jandre zooms out slightly, is that he's sitting above a perfectly crystal clear pool that has obviously welled from a small drainage line, and it's kind of collected here on the roadside. Look at that lovely pool. And you don't get a lot of these around. We certainly haven't had many of them around this particular season because of the lack of rain. But so often the water here is full of mud and uh, becomes even more full of mud once the dung from buffalo and warthogs and various other things fills it up. And this is just crystalline. And what that kingfisher is doing is not thinking about trying to catch a fish here because there won't be any. It might try and catch a frog. They do like to eat frogs. But it will also be picking insects off the surface of the water. And we get all sorts of spectacular little things that like to live on the surface of the water, including a, a sort of water spider that runs along the surface of the water. Yeah, a brilliant bird. Mm. And they use the tension, the natural surface tension of the water to run along. They're not heavy enough to break that up. I suspect that if you were a keen birder, and I know many of you are, if you were to come and sit at a little pool like this for the day, you know, bring yourself a, your favorite snifter, a comfortable chair to sit in and sit behind a gory bush somewhere, semi-hidden, I think you'd see some wonderful birds here. Geraldine says she would bring cheesecake. Well, that's not surprising. Isn't that beautiful? Just fills me with such a sense of kind of peaceful summer being around a little clear pool like this. Even the word pool is very cooling. Is it not, Chandre? Yes. Beautiful reflections. Chandre is very artistic, as you can see. All right, let's continue down here. fairly soon, like I say. I think many of the birds are going to think about heading north. And uh, of course, there are immensely long journeys that many of them make. A lot of the birds from here, of course, won't be making particularly arduous sea crossings. But once those that are going to Europe, uh, and that, that is not one of them, that will stop at the sort of base of the Sahara, the woodland kingfisher will stop. Many of them will then make the traverse over the Sahara and then over the Mediterranean. And often that is a contiguous flight. And it can take some birds more than 40 hours of continuous flight in the air to make it all the way into Europe. Now that is astonishing. 40 hours of flying. These are not, these are not soaring birds, so they will be flapping birds. It will have to go 40 hours without any rest at all which I just think is amazing. 
the whole concept of migration and the whole theme of how migration happens, how birds orientate and navigate, uh, I think is a source of still enormous mystery. Well, just listen to that. I don't know if you can get them. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? Just listen to this. We can't see it. It's a southern grey hornbill. And it's got the most plaintive cry. And as it was doing it, it's sitting above us. We can't get the camera to it. As it was calling, it was sticking its beak in the air and flapping its wings like this in this sort of abject, terrible sadness. And it's wonderful to watch them call. <laughs> OK, we have a swimming reptile with Brent. Let's go and have a look. That is definitely not something you see every day. A leopard tortoise trying to be a terrapin. And he's gone right in there to cool off and have a drink. And he almost seems to be putting his whole head under the water when he drinks. Uh, he's gone, instead of just drinking on the edge, he's decided, no, if a terrapin can do it, so can I. Um, I think it might be quite funny if he steps into a hole just like that. Oh, his head's just above the water. <laughs> I think it's time to return to dry land, my friend. Oh. So the thing is, like, where are the other animals, like hippo and, and elephant, have stood? There's going to be some bigger holes there, and I think he just fell into one, a little bit out of his depth. All right. He really looks like he's enjoying the world. Oh, he's underwater again. Oh, head's just up. He really looks like he's enjoying this. I think you're going the wrong way. And if there is a possibility you might uh, get well out of his depth and step in a big elephant hole, um, but he should have some buoyancy, so it's unlikely that he could drown, but not impossible. I actually think he's floating now. Yeah? He's swimming. He's swimming. There's a tortoise swimming. I have seen them do it before, but not often. So he is off the ground. He's using the buoyancy in his shell. Uh, to float. Way. How many vehicles are there now? It's like a duck. Uh, Neil, just myself. You're welcome to coming in. Thank you. He's just... Uh, quite a nice visual there. You can see he's bobbing around in the water. James and I did discuss having seen tortoise swim, but I don't think I've ever seen a tortoise go that far out into sort of a big body of water. I've seen them swim in pans. Definitely decided these terrapins must be onto something. Oh, paddle, paddle, paddle. He's shoreward bound again. Now look at that. Who would have thought tortoises were such good swimmers? He's not very far from the shore at the moment, maybe a meter and a half. You can just see the shore in the bottom edge of screen. Of course, they're not designed like a terrapin. who's specifically designed for an aquatic life. And these guys are definitely designed to be terrestrial. And he just seems to be having a good old time. Also, of course, a lot of happy terrapins. Um, and you'll see how different they look now when they swim. There we go, Vim. You see the one there? Oh, he just went under the water. Oh, there's another one. And you can see there, just a bit of the head popping out. Oh, sorry, Vim. The tortoise looks like he's going for shore. There we go. He's hit land. Doesn't look like he's quite ready to get out of the water, though. Oh. Watch 
watch out for the floating elephant dung. And I'm sure a few of you have noticed a little bird just in front of him. Very beautiful little bird associated with water. A three-banded plover. There he goes. Big old tortoise. Could easily be over 50, 60 years old. So obviously all the experience needed to go for a dip in Buffalo's Hook. Isn't that incredible? That is absolutely amazing. And a really little interesting bit of information from Leo Pad. Leo Pad says the leopard tortoise is the only tortoise species in Africa that is able to swim. Isn't that amazing? And then another resident of the Buffalo's Hook at the moment is a hippopotamus. I'm sure it could even be one of the ones that we've seen regularly in the pans uh, when there was no other water about. And they will be very happy. I'm sure if it is one, he's very happy not to be stuck in that tiny festering cesspit of a pan. Well, it only became a tiny festering cesspit uh, while he was living in it, and he kept defecating in the, in the same place. But other than that, oh, there's some thick bees. Let me just move the car. with the tortoise invader. I don't think so. I don't think he's going to, as you saw, we arrived when he was walking in and he didn't spend too much time. So I don't think they would have at all uh, become too irritated with him. And there we go. For the bird is out there, some water thickness. Very happy to have water to stand around again. They've been standing around in the shade quite often. the synonymous sounds of the early evening out here in Africa is the call of the water thickening. So it doesn't look like the elephants are playing along. They might still be on their way, though. Or they might have found a nice wallow in the middle of the bush there that we don't know about. Uh, there are a few in that block. I have walked past a couple of them. But let's carry on checking this area. And it is just so wonderful and clear and blue and green and the colors are incredible and more wildflowers which i'm very excited about just double checking that the queen didn't come for a meander down here Impala everywhere we look, a giant herd of them. I mean, giant is probably a slight hyperbole, but some beautiful impala here. And what I want you to do is just listen to them. Now, of course, they've stopped, but they were grunting at each other. The mothers talking to the lambs and the lambs talking back to their mums, from whom they will shortly be pretty much separated, of course given the fact that they've all weaned now. And if that isn't one of the most elegant things you've ever seen, other than Jandre, perhaps, of course, Jandre is also very elegant. And look at the little ox peckers there. She's not looking so good. She's not nearly as pretty as the one that just walked past us. And I think that you're going to find that the parasite load of many of these animals is going to go up and the skin condition is going to go down. 
in the wake of the drought. I think maybe now, of course, there is some greenery. They will pick up condition. I think that's also quite an old impala. And I can just tell that from the kind of, well, she's, she's skinnier than the others. And her right ear, of course, it looks like it's been through the wars. But how gently, did you see her gently move the ox pecker there? I think she's not a youngster. I think she's an old lady of the impala. And of course, there are not many impala out here that will die of old age. Most of them, of course, will die at the teeth and claws of a predator. Because a lion will pick up, a leopard will pick up, a cheetah will pick up if that is a weakened or easy catch. Am I hearing? That's a dung beetle. I thought it was, for a minute there, I thought it was Andrew Francis and his drone. But it's a dung beetle that's just landed. Let's have a look there. I'm going to get out and go. We're going to have a look. Sorry, impalas, don't freak out. I mean you no harm. I just heard a bzzz. Where is it, Jandri? Hmm? Edge of the shadow. Edge of the, Edge of the right. shadow. Three o'clock, backwards. Ah. Right, here we go. These are the plum-coloured dung beetles, uh, so-called because they are indeed plum-coloured. I'm going to put this one back. Let's just have a closer look at them. And I know we've looked at them before, but they've just come out again, you know, because of the rain, and for a long, long time, we didn't have them at all. There he is. And you can see why he's called plum-coloured. It's because he's the colour of a what, Jandre? A Green. banana. Yes, well done. Now, the other interesting thing is that although I can hold him still like this because he can't get at my fingers, if I close my hand about him, it's almost impossible for me to hold him because he is so strong that he manages to creep his way out. And that's, of course, how they dig huge holes relative to their size and bury those balls of dung. He's just wonderful. I'm going to put him back on his dung. Some impala dung this time. There you are, old fellow. Enjoy your meal of dung. You might also be able to hear the sound, beautiful call of the grey-headed bush shrike going. Another lovely summer sound. All right, back in the car, genre. Back on the road we go. Nothing much going on here at the Juma Dam. So we're going to continue along towards some natural pans on... Ah. Now, Willie, you are in Texas, and you want to know about the black tuft that is on the back of the impala's leg. Willie, that is called a fetlock gland. If you look at the bottom, everybody, at the bottom of the kind of ankle joint, uh, it's not the ankle joint, but it's what looks like you'll see a black patch of, of fur, and underneath that is a gland called the fetlock gland. A pheromone that allows the impala to follow each other through thick bush. So they run away from something, uh, they will often kick their back legs out and run. And that leaves a scent of pheromone that they're able to follow each other. So it just is a kind of security arrangement. That's the, that's the kind of accepted theory as to why they have them. Um, I wonder if there isn't some other reason. Oh, there's something really interesting about this, if we can get it. Just watch this hornbill. It was having a dust bath. That's not the only thing it will be doing. Let's just watch. Now, this is a red-billed hornbill, of course, different from the yellow bill that we began with and indeed different from the grey that was making its very sad and mournful call. <laughs> they are unbelievably fast and accurate with those beaks. It was just incredible to watch them before we came live. Um, they were catching these flying termites, or one of them was, and 
just, I mean, unbelievable speed leapt up, caught it out of the air to the tip of the beak. And the coordination required to do that is just astonishing. There it is, sitting on the termite mound there. And as Jerry says, the coordination to follow them with the cameraman is uh, also very impressive. Well done, jean -Dre. That's two compliments you've had from Geraldine this evening. One, of course, for your artistic abilities and the other for your tracking. Mm. You never compliment me, James. That's because I think you'll get above yourself. Yeah, digging out some of the termites. And like I say, a very, very rich source of food. Now, this one's diet. Of course, we had a question about the diet of the yellow-billed hornbill. The red-billed has a smaller beak and, unsurprisingly, has a consequentially smaller diet. So they are smaller by, in terms of size. They will also eat just about anything uh, that is, they can catch. But it'll be probably more fruit, uh, fr more insects than will the yellow bill have. So more in the way of termites and spiders and that sort of thing, and possibly more fruit than the yellow bill, which will eat. And that won't eat things as big as chameleons and snakes. So although the actual body size is really not very different at all, the size of the beak makes a big difference. Right, on we go. Try and maintain signal. Hello, Simon, on Twitter. You say you're in Addo, which to those who are not from Central Park on the sort of east, east in the, on the East Cape coast, it does stretch to the coast, the coast and uh, beautiful part of the world. And you've got giant flightless dung beetles there. Uh, I have never seen a flightless dung beetle. Again, sorry about that, just a low point there. We're back up onto the high ground. Um, so, Simon, I've never seen a flight. They sound fascinating. Of course, there are up to 900 species of dung beetle worldwide, possibly even more than that, and so an intimidating amount. And, I mean, if you look at this book that I have here, you can see the thickness of the book. And, I mean, this book contains... It's a field guide to the insects of southern Africa, but it probably contains at a sort of less than conservative estimate about 5% of the country's insect life. So, I mean, when you talk about dung beetles, uh, I mean, there are probably four or five pages dedicated to dung beetles when you could have two or three volumes of the same size dedicated just to dung beetles. I think we've barely scratched the surface of the mysteries of the invertebrate life forms of planet Earth. Again, great amount of mammals going on here. Now, what I do want to show you, if I can find some, there was a very strong smell in the air this morning. And I couldn't figure out where it came from until we went out again for our little tracking expedition with Renius. And it is, the, it is this tree that you can see in front of us here, Jean-Dre, but this one doesn't have flowers, so I'm assuming these are female trees, perhaps, at least male trees. But they're very, very attractive kind of, oh, well, almost sickly sweet smell. I'll try and find a few. And that's the white berry bush, and it will produce a very delicious white fruit that tastes like a very sweet kind of pea. flower, sort of green, yellowy, yellowy, greeny, white. If that makes any sense at all. Let's 
see if we can find one for you now. There's another hornbill. Now, there is a, an interesting behavior that I'm hoping one of them is going to engage in, and that is the behavior called anting. And what a bird like this will do is find an ant nest on the ground, often on a sandy patch of so soil like this, open its wings and lie over the top of the ant's nest. And the ants then crawl all over the wings and all over the rest of the feathers, and sometimes the bird will actually pick up individual ants and drop them onto the feathers. And most ants, of course, or many ants, produce formic acid. And we think that the reason that they drop the ants onto them like that is to, for the formic acid to kill off parasites that might be living on the feathers, which is just the most remarkable adaptation. This one, of course, is not anting. He's watching us as intently as we are watching him. <laughs> Off to the left-hand side, you can hear some magpie shrikes calling. <whistles> Liquid whistle. Right, let's move on. Get out of the way, bird, if you're not going to ant. Hello, Vincent. You're in Ohio, and you want to know if we get the national bird here, the blue crane. We do not get the national bird here, the blue crane, Vincent. Um, they like a high felt, they like wet areas, they like flays or um, inundated wetlands. And so that's where you'll find the blue crane. Not down here in the dry, semi-arid low felt. Thank you, Vincent. You're obviously a bit of an ornithologist. There he is, sitting on a black monkey thorn, whose thorns don't appear to be piercing the bottom of his little passerine feet. Very nice. Well done, Jean-Dre. There's a Nyala. There's a little family of Nyalas. Of course, they don't live in families, but it looks like a family. There's a, a male. And behind him, very low down, you can just see a little bit there, is a baby lamb. And behind that, just, mm, you might just be able to see a bit of the chestnut pelage walking through the woodland there, a cow. They are the most magnificent antelope, those. If ever I was to return as an antelope, I should come back as a nyala. Very nice the way he stood behind that bush there, isn't it, Jean-Dre? Making it extremely easy to see his magnificence. Now we can see just his horn. How wonderful. Let's carry on. The smell of this afternoon is just too wonderful for words. After a day of sunshine, which has brought out that petrichor smell, and it's brought out a kind of smell of fresh grass, and it's just delightful to be out. Of course, the smell of the birds. Black, green, black, green. We are. Everyone? Not sure what's. So, welcome back, everyone. It seems like the gremlins are really plaguing us on this sunset safari. We do apologize profusely. So, uh, VM and I are on our way to go check where the lines we had with Jamie were this morning. And we couldn't find any tracks of Karula, and those elephants didn't appear at Bufalsuk. I think they found their own wallow elsewhere. So, we're not too far from where those lions are, and we're hoping that they've come across from the main road into Juma, in search of a bit of shade. Lots of termites fluttering about.
coming up to where the lions have been. to look at seamlessly going back into the sentence that I was giving to you except that I Okay, I think it's a little bit better now. Now, here are the natural pans I was talking about. Here is one here. And this one, of course, is much more typical color for the water that sits out here. It's a muddy kind of soup in which the terrapins are lurking, waiting for unsuspecting insects and even the odd bird that comes down to drink. And we might just be able to see a terrapin pop its head up and the ripples that you can see are from terrapins. Hmm. Right. So that, that, that very clear kind of stream was very unusual. I think largely because it was a kind of rocky base to it as opposed to clay. Ah, hello, Beefy. There is a buffalo. Oh, he's walking towards us. Stout fellow. Yes. There's a buffalo bull, and he's been lying in one of these pans. Now, if you ever come down a road like this or through the bush, and you are worried about animals and what you can see, local knowledge is always a an important thing, and if you knew that there were pans here, this, of course, is the animal that you would be watching out for as you walk through the bush down here. They love, on a warm day, to be lying in and around the water. He's got very kind of low, drooping horns, which give him, gives him the appearance of a judge, I feel. A particularly unimpressed judge a judge that might send one to the gallows. <laughs> he, he is a deeply morose-looking fellow. Very morose fellow, yes. Cheer up, old boy. It's a beautiful afternoon here, Sunday afternoon. He's just relieving himself as well, of course which is a buffalo's prerogative. Well, I don't think he's going to do much at all, so let's carry on. <laughs> let's go across to the buffalo's worst enemy. And indeed, the buffalo's worst enemy, these particular ladies, uh, just finished snacking on a buffalo the night before last. And here we go, the big uh, sticks girls, all looking very happy, healthy, and pregnant. lying in a perfect little lion triangle. Doesn't look like they've done much today. They're probably about 25 meters from where Jamie left them this morning. And for a lion, a nice hot day today, when you've got a full belly, what better to do than nap? 
you can see they're not breathing nearly as heavily as they were yesterday. Still some heavy breathing in this hot weather, but definitely far more deep and regular. And the temperature is dropping off quite nicely now. Sleepy kitties. So it looks like there might be some, oh. I was hoping maybe, we might hope maybe that in the next little while, they might move to have a drink. There's a little pan very close to here, just up over there, just across over there. There's a, there's a pan. There might even be some water in this little creek bed that's right here. And I think we're just going to try to drive around to the other side of them. It looks like there could be some nice face, uh, some nice light on that other lion's face. that I'm sure a lot of you would like about the lions. Uh, the Inkahuma girls uh, gave James and Renius quite a, a nice track this morning, but they did unfortunately track them all the way into Buffalo's Hook. They then proceeded to walk very far and about probably seven or eight kilometers and met up with some Birmingham boys. So there are four Birmingham boys with them. And I'm not sure who did the buffalo killing, but they've got two dead buffalo. Uh, and so five Nkuma lionesses, four Birmingham boys, and two dead buffalo. So truly buffalo's worst enemy. There we go. See, isn't that good, Vim? Mm -hmm. They're pretty faces. Let's see how long she can keep her eyes open. I don't think very long. You can already see the heavy blink. I can see the ears twitching away to try to keep the stable flies at bay. Stable fly, a very small, irritating insect if you're a lion. Oh, there we go. Go away, fly. It looks very similar to a house fly except it's a carnivorous little guy, it likes to bite, particularly a lot of animals' ears, and it does feed off the blood. So Gracie, who's eight years old, and Gracie says, Brent, do you mean we're gonna have leopard and lion babies soon? Yes, Gracie, I think the sticks are going to give birth probably, oof, difficult to say, but I'd say within the next month and a half. So not too long. And it looks like more, it almost looks like all of them are females. I mean, all the females are pregnant. VM on out. Oh, is he going to land? Where'd he go? Uh, VM really dislikes me when I do this, but there's an incredibly beautiful creature. There we go, he's landed. Look at that. Look at those colors on that acrea butterfly. It looked like a Christmas tree acrea to me, but I'll double check that for you. Where's my butterfly book? There it is. But yes, Gracie, babies. Yay! So it looks like Shadow's got cubs, and uh, Gorilla obviously has cubs. Oh, there you go. the butterfly's back. I'll spot it there. Be so nice if it landed somewhere nice and close so we could get a good view. It popped off the side. Sneaky, stealthy acria. As you can see, the lions have taken great offense to the butterfly fluttering around. And if it is, I think I'm pretty confident it is a Christmas tree acria. And that is one of my favorites. There we go. 
here. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just trying to find the acria in the book. And there's quite a lot of, here we go, acria species. I'm just going to make sure that I'm not fibbing to you. And there's also pseudo acras, so mimics. But I'm pretty confident. So we've got to the acria butterflies. And we can have a look there. And lots of different variations. And there we go. If I remember correctly, the Latin name is acria horta. But I will double check that now for the Christmas tree acria. And I'm just going to see it there. I'm not seeing it. There it is. That's it. Acrea zetus acrea. And I'm pretty sure that's the one we've just seen now. Oh, let me check quickly on this. Yes. Now, this book was written by a very clever man who knows a lot about butterflies, but not a lot about common sense. So to try and find the information that goes with the picture is quite the challenge. You have to then go into the... Latin names, the index to the scientific names, and you've got to find the acria. At least the acrias are A and they're right at the beginning. I should remember, what was it again? Acria zetus horta. Okay, acria, acria, acria zetus. At 43, so that must be yes, and 156. So instead of just putting the number where you should go there, I'm sure there was method to his madness when he did it, but definitely this book was not designed for the layman. Oh no. Where is this now? Oh, is that, did you hear that large lion sigh? Oh, legs in the air, trying to get a bit of heat, and you can see why we think they're pregnant. see those engorged nipples definitely showing that she's expecting Virginia is wondering if these lions are all pregnant together. Will they all den together? Uh, no, Paula, they'll den individually. Uh, and then only once the cubs are a little bit older will they introduce them to their siblings. Okay, give me two seconds to figure out this very complicated book and I will be back with you. Animosa. Acria animosa. So actually, I think I was incorrect uh, originally when I called it a Christmas tree acria. I think it's actually an acria, um, what is it now? A large spotted acria. And there is the large spotted acria, the male, and the Christmas tree acria down here doesn't have as many spots on it, but they are equally beautiful. There we go, a large spotted acre. And I think that's a new one for the butterfly list. And I'm not sure what we're on yet, so maybe someone can let me know how many butterflies have we managed to catch on camera so far. Sleepy lions. I know, I'm hoping there's this gorgeous golden light at the moment. Now, I'm really hoping that we do get some of that light on these lions. Uh, 
Joyce in Pennsylvania is wondering about the average litter size. Uh, in this part of the world, it is two, uh, although sometimes three, but generally average litter size is two. And in captivity, there have been recorded cases over 10 cubs born to a single female. Of course, those are in very strange circumstances, uh, lions living in captivity. I don't think that that would ever happen in the wild. Uh, the amount of pressure put on that lioness to raise 10 cubs would be far too much. Now, lions are quite nice to each other, and being the only social cat, uh, it could be a very big benefit for these three lionesses being pregnant at the same time. So they will actually share the suckling ju nursing uh, duties, so they will let a cub that is not their suckle, so very different to hyenas. So if a cub that does not belong to them, it belongs to one of their sisters or moms or aunts, uh, wants a drink, it's more than welcome to. And the same goes for her cubs with all the rest of the others as well. Very sleepy kitties. Who knows? Hopefully they'll come visit us on quarantine. They haven't been down to quarantine for a while. It was just before Christmas where two of them made a visit and ate some baby wildebeest. So we can see these two, the belly's really nice. You can really see that engorged mammary gland. And when they stand up, you can actually tell the difference when they're hungry uh, as to pregnant. I'm just gonna move forward a little bit. And change the view up slightly. That was the stick, ladies. No need to fret yourself. I see, don't stand up. Please don't. As you can see, they took very little notice of that. And you can see the third female as well, showing those signs of pregnancy. And you see the remnant cub spots on her. Those little spotty markings all around there. Now those are very important when a lion is a cub. So lion cubs are much more spotty when they're little than when they're big. And the reason for that is to have a little bit of camouflage when they're left in their den while mom goes off to find some dinner. So you do often see uh, on some lion, adult lions more than others, you can see those remnant spots. Some flying ants emerging around the lines. So we can see the three Styx girls here. And Keith in Long Island is wondering, are there more than just three lionesses in the Styx pride? Are they separated? Um, Keith... Traditionally, uh, going back many years when I was in the southern Sabi Sands, there were, there were quite a few more. At the moment, I've only ever seen three. Yeah, have you ever seen any more than three Styx lionesses together? No. I, I, I might be wrong, but I think this is the only three lionesses remaining in the pride. I think one or two were killed by the Birminghams last year, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think these are the only remaining Styx lionesses. How beautiful creatures and in perfect condition at the moment. one of my favorite smaller critters out there in the bush, the monarch butterfly. And 
Joyce in New Hampshire is wondering, do we have a monarch butterfly here? And we do. There we go. That is the African monarch. Um, it doesn't migrate like the ones you guys get in North America. I know, as Joyce was saying, you can track the uh, movement of the monarch butterflies on their great migration through North America. Now, interestingly enough, monarchs feed off milkweed, which renders them noxious, so bad to eat for other animals. And they've got a very pretty little caterpillar. There he is. That's the monarch caterpillar. Or larval stage and now being poisonous obviously is a good thing now I've got to find where the diet is though um, and but in a lot of cases a lot of other butterflies or in this case a single species of butterfly has learned how to or not learned it has evolved to mimic the monarch I'm gonna try to find you a picture of one now it's called a diadem so it looked exactly like a monarch and if I can find one, so we've got, oh, here, there we go. That is the African diadem. So there's the female. And I'm going to flick back to the monarch, which is on the first page. Sorry, Liam. So I see there's, there's a female monarch. And there's a female diadem. You notice know, those two spots are one of some of the main things that you're seeing are different. Now, as a female, you got to, protect your babies lay the eggs now so they look and fly like a monarch the male doesn't he flies around really fast there he is there black and white so uh, the birds know he can be eaten but they don't take the chance with the ladies so there we go uh, the diadem a mimic of the african monarch so when you ever out here and you're looking at butterflies be always careful to check for these two spherical spots or these little dots in the wing there that is the factor in uh, the main easiest way to identify the two different species the color is also a bit different but if you catch a feet in dips that's the best way to identify the difference between a diadem and a monarch oh kitty cats sun's going down you should start stretching now getting ready to move hopefully so from a terrestrial predator to an avian predator let's go see what james has got well much more a scavenger than a predator everybody although yes it will kill on its own that is a batelier a juvenile batelier eagle the second one that we've seen recently is one was down by treehouse dam a, a few minutes ago but of course we didn't have any signal there, so we couldn't show you that one. But I'm most pleased to be showing you this one. Stable screen and stable feed. There he is. Now, you can identify him by the fact that he has, well, you probably can't see it there, but if you had very powerful binoculars like mine, you'd be able to see that his face is almost bare, and that face will turn red when he, come, he becomes an adult. Here comes a semi-adult up into the tree. You see him, jean -Dry? He's in the other tree uh, to the left. You can just see him there. You'll see a flash of red on his face. There you go. There he is. You can just see his movement there. There we go. Now, it's not quite an adult, and I know that because as he flew in, I could see that his underside, and he is a he, is not quite pure white and black. So it's got a very distinct white and black stripe on the male adult, and that one's still a bit mottled. So we've interestingly got probably a, a two or three year old is the one on the left right hand side and on the left a nearly seven year old eagle. So mm, let's say six and a half. Just one more molt to go before he becomes completely adult. Similar sized but obviously the feathers are completely different. And that's quite interesting with birds. Often they grow very quickly but their plumage takes a while to achieve adult plumage. So he's no smaller than an adult, but he's at least four or five years off being what we would call an adult. Very nice, Jean-Dry. Let us press on. Um, we're heading slowly towards the hyena den. 
The sun is starting to dip over the western horizon, bathing the low felt in glorious golden hues. That's Jean Dres with coughing. He's got consumption. Bad luck, Jean Dres. You all right, are you? now drinking some water, of course, which is very important when you have consumption. <laughs> Gracie, I'm going to address your comment just now. I just saw a bird. There it is. Well done, Jean Dre. Any idea what he is? That is called a ground scraper thrush, everybody. Everyone together, one, two, three, ground scraper thrush. Not brush, Geraldine, thrush. And one of two thrush species that we get here. I just think these ones are rather lovely. They live on the ground and they've got spots on the front. And the reason he's turned his back to us, of course, is because he's much more obvious when he looks at us with his front. I think they normally live in pairs, so there should be another one around here somewhere. I'm not going to dally too much. I think let's move on towards the hyena den. Gracie, you say and, uh, that I shouldn't come back as an antelope like the Nyala I said I wanted to come back as because I might end up hanging in a tree being eaten by a cat. Yes, good point, Gracie. I shall rethink. Um, if I had to come back as an antelope, then it would be a Nyala. But if I had to come back as an animal, I think I'd probably come back as an elephant. Because then no cat would ever be strong enough to pull me into a tree. Oh, stunning picture of the mountains there with the sun going down. We'll just give you a brief look at it as we drive along. Do not become seasick, everybody. Hello, Paul. You're on YouTube. Nice question why we drive around. Um, you say, do we prefer to track on foot or in the vehicle? Paul, unquestionably on foot. The tracking, the process of finding animals is much easier if you're actually following track for track on foot. It's almost impossible in a vehicle because you can't, of course, I was just checking the crab's nest. That's where Pinchy Winer lives. Um, it's almost impossible to track in a vehicle because, if, say, a, a leopard walked across here and into the block, then you wouldn't be able to follow its tracks in the car. You'd have to get off and follow them on foot. And, of course, I mean, my skill levels as a tracker are, well, pathetic in comparison with someone like Renius's. And unless it's a very clear track of a large animal like a rhino or an elephant, it's actually very difficult for me to follow them, or buffalo. To follow a cat track in the conditions that we've got now, with moist ground that's gone all hard on top from the sun, is very difficult indeed. And you've truly got to have skills, the likes of which you cannot develop unless you do it every single day for years and years and years. And I mean, uh, <laughs> when you consider the amount of astonishing amount of money that bankers are paid, for example, supposedly because of the talent that they have. When you compare that skill compared with where, I mean, half, as we know, the bankers of the world lost more money than had ever been made in 2008, uh, and they went home with enormous bonuses, where a man like Renius, who's got a suite of skills that probably only a handful of people of, in all the seven billion on the world have those suites of that suite of skills which could so beautifully connect us back to the wilderness and to the earth are only appreciated in such a very small area which i think is quite sad what have we seen ah elephants very nice this looks like one young bull down here um, yeah, one young bull. People, I'm not going to drive off road after him. I do want to get to the hyena den and the sun is starting to set. So if you don't mind, we're going to carry on, I think. One young bull, very peacefully eating. 
very peacefully eating some Cumbritum apiculatum. I'll probably rue that decision, of course. Ooh, mud flicking up. There's more elephants. There's a whole herd of them here. We'll just drive gently by. It's a lovely herd. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop for these. They're too lovely not to. Just briefly, especially especially between that magnificent view that is out to the east there. And that young bull now, of course, will be semi part of this herd. He's almost old enough to be on his own, so he'll just be spending some time alone before he moves off. That is an enormous cow on the right-hand side moving out there. She's huge. She probably stands, hmm, 10 feet at the, at the shoulder. She's almost bull-sized. I mean, she really is very large. Isn't that an amazing view we just had of the last of the golden light? Bathing the low felt. And still, that is not a color that should be for this time of the year. That should just be a thousand different shades of green. There should be none of that brown dotted in amongst it as a result of the drought. Okay, beautiful elephants. Very peaceful Sunday elephants. Hyenas, here we come. I fear me I've left this a bit late on account of the black screen, but we will get a little bit of time there before it gets dark. Now, when we say black screen, what we mean is, of course, that the signal read from the vehicle to the final control disappears for some reason. Uh, this is an unfathomable thing, seemingly uh, more mysterious than the, I don't know, more mysterious than anything, really. More mysterious than quantum theory. drive a little bit faster. David and I had a wonderful run along this road in the middle of the day. Ah, here we have a comment from Simon who told us about the flightless dung beetle of Addo. In Simon, you say you don't live in Addo, you live in Plettenberg Bay. Well, lucky old you. Plettenberg Bay, everybody, is a very attractive town. Well, it's quite a large town now on the... It's in, it's in the Western Cape, kind of border between the Western and Eastern Cape. Uh, very nice, Simon. I hope you're going to be swimming in the sea a little bit later on. And you say you'll send a picture of the flightless dung beetle. That would be wonderful. Thank you. This is a difficult one to answer. You're asking about dung beetles and what is the incubation period for a dung beetle and how many eggs will each dung beetle lay. Well, of course, because there's so many species, that's a semi-impossible question to answer. But we did have those plum-colored dung beetles earlier, and I think that you will find that they will lay, oh, uh, I, I couldn't tell you, probably at least sort of 10 or 20 10 or 20 eggs in a season. And uh, how long is the incubation period? The incubation, I don't think, is very long. It's probably a week or two. Um, but I then think that there's, uh, there's a period of dormancy, and I don't know exactly how it works. But they make the ball, they lay the egg in the ball, and then they bury the ball. And the larva, which looks like a kind of little white grub is born and it eats the dung as its food and that's what happens but then before it kind of becomes an adult it spends time underground until uh, until conditions are favorable so until rain comes softens the ground then it'll come out fly about dig holes lay its own eggs and probably die fairly soon thereafter 
So what I think you'll find is that the incubation period of the eggs is probably of maybe a week or two, and after that, the pupation, pupation period and dormancy period under the ground is extremely variable. So, for example, if a dung beetle is a, one of the last dung beetles of summer, lays an egg in the, in the ground, you know, they'll remain dormant probably for the whole of the winter. But then, I think like's happened now, those first few dung beetles that came out when the ground was initially soft, laid their eggs, buried them, and I'm sure those are the offspring that have come up again now. So a difficult one to answer, Kathy, but it's one of those brilliant questions that gets everyone thinking. So thank you for that. Hello, James Richard. You want to know if anybody has set up markers so that I might find the hyena den tonight, unlike last night. James Richard? No, they haven't. But what we did is set Brent up with some lions so that in case I get lost, we will be with him until the hyena den. We'll see you there. So the sun is starting to set a beautiful orange hue appearing on the horizon and the Styx ladies have not moved a muscle. They're still in the exact same spot and uh, sleeping very nicely. So I'm sure there's lots of chat about the cubs and lots of speculation about when they're going to be born. As I said, I think um, probably a month, month and a half. But hopefully we do get to see a bit more of them. They have been spending quite a lot of time outside of our Travis area recently. So that has made it a little difficult to keep track of them. So I've only seen them. I thought I hadn't seen them since last year. I was, I was wrong. I forgot that we bumped into them uh, with the water back further down on Gowrie Main in the early morning. Quick, across to James. This has got a remarkable kind of uh, feeling of deja vu about it. Of course, just before we got to the hyena den yesterday, we saw two ground hornbills. There are three in this little group, although you can only see two of them. Um, it must be part of the same group. So I think the one that we initially saw yesterday, which I thought was that lone one that we often see, uh, possibly wasn't, or he's found a little flock of another two, which is great. And they are, for those of you who don't know, a highly endangered species of hornbill. And they are looking quite possibly for tortoises. They like to eat tortoises. Those chisel-like beaks are very good at eating tortoises. But they'll also eat termites. They'll eat rodents if they can get them. They'll eat scorpions if they can catch them. They basically will eat any kind of meat that they can overpower. Yeah, that one's eating little termite alates. As I said, those royal flying termites, hugely popular amongst all the animals. Very cool. And even that massive bull. Now, I mean, again, you can't really see the size. Probably about two and a half feet tall that bird, with a bill that is at least, mm, I'd say, six in to eight inches long. Hmm. All right, let's leave them there. Back to Brent and his lions, so that I don't embarrass myself on my way to the hyenas. So, there's this incredible sound above us. Unfortunately, I think they're gonna, might get past us, I'm gonna try his best. Did you get them there, Vim? Little spots. Little spots up there. You can just hear them flying above us. This toot -toot -toot -toot, and it's the sound of European beaters heading back towards their roost. I don't know if we can you hear. I don't know if you guys can hear. High pitched little trip. Another group coming in. Here 
here we go. Just off in the distance. Fortunately, we can all... I think they're just a little bit too far now. But it was incredible. Just this massive flock of bee eaters suddenly appeared. I was trying to see whether they were Carmine or European. But they were, were European. So we did get a little bit of movement while you were gone. There was a bit of a roly-poly. And that was about it. We really, really are hoping that they're going to go for a drink close by. Cedar Hill would like to know what I think the chances are of these lions giving birth on Juma. I would have to say very slim, William. I would probably say less than a 5% chance. Uh, they, the Styx lionesses, uh, the majority of their den site seems to be further south in the Mawati and even onto Mo the northern sections of Mala Mala. So I, I, d I highly doubt that uh, the Styx girls will give birth on Juma. And I do definitely hope to be proved wrong there. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And they did bring them through when they were quite young about. The last set of cubs they had must have been about two months the first time we saw them. And those were unfortunately killed by the Birminghams during the Pride takeover. But see, the next generation are on the way. wondering, will the, these lionesses introduce the cubs to the males as well? Most definitely, Ava, uh, probably when they're a little bit older, sort of two months, maybe even a little bit younger than that, but normally around six weeks to eight weeks um, that they will introduce them to the rest of the members of Pride, the males included if they're around. Hello, big girl. If we just sit quietly for a second, all the different sounds we can hear. I just heard a goa bird alarm calling, and we got some lessons from Renius about how to differentiate what they're alarming at. So I would say that's alarming at a bird of prey. A high-pitched alarm call. Oh, are we going to roll over? No. Nope. And there was a, a half a lift of a leg uh, before going straight back to the original position. So let us go across to one of Lion's eternal enemies. So thank you, James Richard. Here we are, the hyena den. I obviously drove straight here because I've never been lost in my life in the bush. I don't know where that came from. Absolute nonsense. And what we have here is the matriarch, madam, and her two little babies. Unless I've lost my mind. No, I don't think I've lost my mind. That's what we have. And, of course, it's becoming a little bit difficult to tell, simply because their spots have come out. They're no longer black. And those are the two January babies who are now pushing mm, January, February, two months old. Mm, vicious biting. You can see her, she's easily identifiable, the mother, by those scuffed ears, scuffed. They've been bitten and torn, probably by many cubs throughout the years, and also by other hyenas. And that mewling that that cub is making is because she is also marking. And it's so interesting that from such a young age, they're one of the only animals that do this, from such a very young age, hyenas will mark territory. They'll, she'll rub that anal gland over all the bushes around here, and if you watch them carefully, you can see them do it. All of the youngsters will do it. And sitting just above there is November. I don't know where the Januarys are, at least the Decembers, but that's little November there. 
quite impossibly orange color behind there. Isn't that stunning? Just a magnificent sight. And just reaffirming bonds, and of course, little January will feel completely comfortable rubbing herself up against November, simply because her mother, of course, is the matriarch. So she will have inherited that status. She or he, I'm not sure. I've, I've had a look at both of them, and I wouldn't be surprised if they're both males. Just from a look at their genitalia. You can see November smelling now, where one of the Joe's January babies has just marked with the anal gland. Mm, a lovely calm is starting to, sit, to descend as the sun falls down below the horizon. At the end of another week for the hyenas, they of course have no idea that's the end of the week. Isn't that lovely? Beautiful, beautiful picture. <laughs> so I'm surprised that the others are not around here. I don't know where they would be. And I did hear some, well, I heard a little bit of kind of alarm calling from the den inside Gallego shortcut, which indicates to me that maybe not all the hyenas are here. Maybe some have moved on. Let's just keep an eye out, though. And see them venturing further and further away. And they're certainly doing that a lot before the other babies did, I think, as a result of the fact that they're just so much more confident. They're just so much more confident given the status that their mother has. Hyenas, of course, for those of you who don't know, will inherit their mother's status. Their fathers have virtually no status within the clan. There is a male hierarchy, but interestingly, and this is certainly the only mammal species that I know of in which this kind of condition occurs, normally it is the lowest, or often it's the low-ranking males that the females will mate with. And that's because often the low-ranking males are imports, they're immigrants that will have come into the clan from outside, and so it makes genetic sense for them to mate with those low-ranking males. And of course, it doesn't make any difference what rank of male they mate with, because it is the female, it is a female-dominated society, and it is the female rank that they will, will inherit. And it's completely the opposite in just about every other mammal. Just about every other social mammal, including the human being, it is normally the father's status that is inherited. And while that might not be particularly uh, pleasing to hear for a human being, that is exactly what happens. Look at the power in the shoulders there. She lifts her neck. Look at the muscles in the neck and the shoulder. Now, she is, she's about a 70-kilogram animal. That's about 170 pounds. And most of that mass is packed into the jaw muscles, neck muscles, and shoulder muscles. Here comes a little one coming closer to have a look and say hi. And David, I agree with you on YouTube. You say, look at their faces. They're so quizzical. Well, absolutely, look at this little thing. Not very coordinated yet, but very quizzical indeed. And they lose that when they become adults, of course. They don't look nearly quite so quizzical. And the other thing I notice about these animals is that and I think many of you notice it, we are so used to our 
our own children are, you know, the human baby is the most vulnerable thing in the world. And when you see these little cubs and how they're able to kind of uh, fall over the place and spike themselves with logs and run over thorns almost from birth, it is just quite astonishing how much tougher they are. And obviously they have to be, but I'm just amazed all the time. I guess the same goes, you know, for, if you look at the rural areas out here where there's very little in the way of medical support and, you know, parents don't go around buying strollers and prams for excessive amounts of money. Uh, kids play with stones and old bicycle wheels and that sort of thing. They also grow up, I guess, a lot tougher than they would in a Western society. Oh, big elephant bull, let's go across to Brent. Look at this, guys. We've got, oh, there's a tree behind me. I'm gonna miss it, Vim. Oh, sort of, sorry about that, Vim. But with this lovely young Ellie bull walking with a magnificent vista behind him, we've got the Drakensberg Mountains, and the sun's just popped down over them. And it looks like, look at that, isn't that just spectacular? Nice young bull, probably just over 20. And the way he's sniffing along the ground, I think he's trailing a breeding herd. A slow walk. And he looks... I didn't get a great look at him there, a very brief look, but he looks like he could be the gentleman who liked to come visit us in the garden. I think he's going to disappear off. I'll we'll give you a view of the bottom as he disappears into the bush. I saw quite a distinct rip in his right ear. So I do think it is the, the same gentleman who liked to come visit us when there was no greenery around. Brilliant. Is it the nation or the ant on my camera? Is there an, a what? One of these hectic ants. A biting ant? Yeah. Oh, Viem is being attacked by something. Let me see if I can find it. Oh. It's on the cables now. Is it on the cables? Oh, but you do have another creature on your camera. Is it? Oh, that one as well. <laughs> Vian is surrounded by ho -hos. Let me see if I can get this one before he escapes. And this is quite a cool little guy. Oh, here we go. So I'm going to hold him very gently by his back legs. And so he doesn't kick or break them. Um, I'm going to let him go shortly. Uh, is a Katie did. I think oh, I'm holding him at a very strange angle. Does it a dash again? Uh huh. Yeah. So a little Katie did. More close to the dash. Very cool little guys. Bright green. You can see. I turn him sideways. It's, that's difficult. I don't want to hurt him. His body actually looks like a leaf. Uh, so he's camouflaged nicely. And they make the most insane screaming noise. They have the most high-pitched noisy noise, and if you get one stuck in your room, you definitely want to murder them after about 20 minutes. And it can be quite difficult to find, but shame. I'm gonna let this little guy go. He was sitting up on VM's mic there. And we're gonna give you one last quick look at the sunset before back to those beautiful hyenas with James. Oh. Take off, it flies back. There's a little hyena here. I think, I think the February one from last year. She's just, she's just arrived. And we're just going to get into a better position here because everyone came around this side. Now, what's interesting to me is that the little ones are so inquisitive still of the vehicle, but this is one who's now almost a yearling, I think. Unless it's June, I find it so difficult once they get to this age. She's lost her kind of inquisitiveness with the vehicles. She's 
she's far more reticent to come too near to us. And you'll see she'll probably move away as we move gently into this little clearing. I'm just going to try and move in gently. Of course, there's so many bumps and things around here that it's almost impossible. You can see, the youngsters are not like that. They're completely comfortable around the car. There we go. So that's not ideal, of course, to give them a bit of a fright, but sometimes it is unavoidable. Chandra, where do you want me? Like that? <laughs> I'm now leaning at a precarious angle out of the vehicle. I can point at the hyenas there. Hello, Deborah. You want to know if hyenas do the Fleming grimace? You say you've never seen it before. Um, hyenas, would they do a Fleming grimace? First of all, let me just explain what it is. A Fleming grimace is when they, uh, animals like leopards and lions and zebra, I've seen buffalo do it, elephants even do it to a certain extent. They drop the soft palate at the back of their mouths, often by lifting up the top lip, and that opens up a tract to an organ in the brain called the organ of Jacobson, or the vemoronasal organ. And what that does is interpret the pheromones that have been smelt. So often it's in animals that are checking the reproductive status of females. And that's what Fleming is. And I have never seen a hyena do it, but that's mainly because hyenas are generally relatively secretive maters. We have seen it here before, but I suspect if it's not obvious, so well, that's my hat, that's wonderful. Um, if it's not obvious, Deborah, I suspect that there is a, a way of using that organ of Jacobson to check for reproductive status. So while it might not be a grimace, they will do something that helps them to interpret those signals. Look at this, isn't this wonderful? And again, the two little ones are very confident because they are the matriarch's youngsters. So they're very happy. John, oh, Jesus, please. There you go, that's better. All right. I'm now completely out of the way, everyone. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so, Keith, you're in Long Island, and an interesting question, what's going to happen to the January King kid, kids as they get older, given that they are so dominant, or they're part, they're offspring of the dominant female? Um, Keith, um, it depends whether they're male or female, obviously. If one of them is a female, it's highly likely that she, she look at that, it's highly likely that she will eventually inherit the matriarch, uh, the matriarchy of this uh, of this clan, unless there's an older female, an older daughter of the matriarch, and I suspect there probably is. Um, but then she might inherit it after that. Although I think quite likely that if if you are not the first female cub of the matriarch. Uh, then rather like with the royal family of, of England, uh, you don't stand much chance of getting, uh, you or, and your offspring stand almost no chance of getting to the throne. So I think if they are male, however, often they have a choice. They have a kind of choice. If they stay within this clan, they will be right at the top of the male hierarchy. But if they leave the clan, um, they will drop way down the hierarchy, but the advantage of that, of course, will mean that they will have the chance to mate. It's unlikely that as dominant or high-ranking males within this clan, being so closely related to the matriarch, that they will actually ever have the opportunity to mate. So they can stay here and have a good meal all the time, or they can go off to another clan and have the opportunity to pass on their genetic legacy. the little tails up. <laughs> Hello, Missy, you're on YouTube. Here comes another hyena here to the left, Chandri. She is covered in muck. That looks like corky, I think. 
uh, we might get the December ones coming out now. Um, Missy, you want to know if we've seen the one that was attacked by the hyenas, at least by the wild dogs the other day, 10 wild dogs set upon one hapless hyena female. And you want to know if we've seen her again. Um, I have not seen her again unless... That's not her, is it? No. Just zoom in on the head there, if you don't mind, jean -Dre. No, that's Corky. You can see by those little marks on the top of her head. So I haven't seen her again, and I think quite strongly that she is the mother of November, not November, of June. She was the one with the scar back. And I haven't seen her again, you see. This rather bizarre mating ritual, of course, is completely typical of hyenas. And this is just how they say hello, everyone. And it gives us the best chance to see who's male and who's female. Interesting, I love your queries like this. You say Darwin, Darwinism suggests survival of the fittest, which in turn would suggest that males must fight for dominance in a need to move or to pass on their genetic legacy. Ravi, um, it's not quite like that. Natural selection works on a species as a whole. So it's, it doesn't work on individuals necessarily, and it's certainly, oh look, here's another hyena coming in. I think that's, that's either young, yeah, that's young June coming in now. Um, Ravi, so it works on the species, and what it means is that the strategy that this species has evolved, this matriarchal or female-dominated society where the female dominates and, uh, you know, they're the kind of, unlike in other mammal societies, they are the ones uh, to whom... Um, allegiance is owed and to whom the the kind of uh, the the responsibility of looking after the society is is born um, that's just the most successful strategy for this particular animal so the natural selection the darwinian natural selection works on the entire species and that's why it's perfectly um, it's not unusual now, the reason that it doesn't happen like this in so many other animals, here comes, <laughs> here comes another little one to the left. Now, materializing out of the woodwork. That's one of the Decembers. Now, the reason that it doesn't work like that often with mammals is that for the simple reason that it is much easier for a male to leave more offspring than it is for a female to leave more offspring, obviously. Because for a male, it's just the investment of mating. For a female, of course, it's the investment of a gestation period and a dangerous birth and then looking after the youngster. And that's why in males, it's normally uh, the males that kind of, why in mammals, it's normally the males that dominate and why in many birds where that isn't the case because of course the female can just lay the egg and then hand the responsibility over to the, to the male birds uh, often you find the system is different where females if they don't dominate they're certainly the ones that have more than one partner so ravi this is an interestingly different situation but it works for the species and that's why it has survived It's getting quite dark, everyone, so we'll watch for a little while. I wonder where those December cubs have come from. I'm, I'm very interested to know why they've been lying away from the den. There might be a puddle of water not too far away from here, and maybe the parents took them off for a little swim there.
Well, we're going to sit here for a little bit longer, but while the lions, there's huge action going on at the lion sighting at the moment. So let's head across there. We'll stay here for now. Look at that, magnificent. We've just arrived in the nick of time. A bit of movement going on. She's going to come right in front of us. Hopefully she's going to go to that little water hole just, just inside, yeah? There's the other lioness there. But as it's getting darker, oh, big yawn. <laughs> So D, who's in Southampton in the United Kingdom, is wondering, will be pre being pregnant compromise their hunting abilities? No, it won't, D, and lions still have to eat even when they are pregnant. So it doesn't in any way compromise them. Just want to see, oh, she's coming back here. So lions will often do this. There we go, get up. A bit of stretching, defecation, urination, and then lie back down again. <laughs> it's not that uncommon, but it, these are good signs that they are going to start moving. Probably not too far with those big bellies there. still quite hot. I'd probably say it's still just under 30 degrees Celsius. Maybe 28, 29, somewhere around there. So while we wait for these lions to get moving, James has got one of my favorite little creatures in the bush. Hey, you away from the unbelievable carnage going on at the lion sighting there, but let's just have a look here at this African bullfrog and he of course is very excited because the night has fallen and this is his time to go and find some flying termites of which there are millions flying about the place and so he's just kind of warming up for the night. Slightly different colors from the one we saw the other night and he's probably, I mean I actually can't see him Jean Ray, where is he? Ah oh, there he is, I see him now. He's probably about three inches long so while he looks absolutely massive, I've no doubt, if you've got a big screen, he's only about three inches long, and he will be trying... He'll probably sit there patiently, and then he'll hop about a little bit until he finds a place where the termites are coming out. And I suspect he's on the soft ground, and you know, you know we were driving over those bumps as we came in here. Those bumps are part of a termite mound, an underground subterranean uh, termite mound of either harvester termites or odontotermes. And he will, he will know that somehow. How he'll know that, I've no idea, but he'll wander around here and try and find some of those termites during the course of the night. He's being about as active as the lions at the moment, so we'll move on. Well done, Jean-Dre. Let's head back to the lions. So, oh, look at this one. She's doing a bit of preening on the other side of us. So we're literally surrounded by lions at the moment. A lioness on either side and one directly in the front behind that bush. Fortunately, we can't see her. There we go. A bit of grooming going on. tongue is like sandpaper and of course quite useful for removing 
dirt, blood, grime from themselves, but you wouldn't want to be licked too much by a lion. Uh, you would start losing your skin. Yawn coming. Oof, there we go. So we occasionally see the Styx Pride and the Nkuma Pride in similar areas, and Joyce in New Hampshire is wondering, would they ever join to make a single big pride? Uh, Probably not, Joyce, and they're not related females. So lion prides are made up of related female lionesses. Oh, female lioness, that can't be true. Uh, related lionesses. So the sticks and the inkumas are not related, so they wouldn't join. So all the females you see in a pride of lions are almost always related. Of course, there's probably always an exception to the rule but uh, not that I know of, all of them will be related females. Look at those eyes, aren't they just spectacular? You can see all the bugs buzzing around her, attracted by our lights. Jennifer on YouTube says she thought birds preen and, oh, there's a line behind me, and turn around. Um, and cats groom, uh, that is correct, Jennifer. I was just playing around with words a little. Uh, well, you know humans can also preen. If you've ever seen uh, certain individuals of both sexes these days getting ready to go out to dinner or to a party, there's much preening that goes on, wouldn't you agree, Vim? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And certain individuals in our camp have been known to preen and prep as well. Mm, not me. Not me either. Vim and I, we're rugged, manly men. No need for preening and, and whatnot. So, of course, this grooming is, plays quite an important, important part. It helps the lions remove little parasites. Oh, you can see that belly now, how heavy it is. She might be a little bit more pregnant than the others. They were all mating with the Birmingham boys around the same time. Time to go for a drink. So Robin in Maryland raises a very good point that the Birminghams have not fathered cubs before. Would they know not to kill them? Oops, sorry, I'm trying to grab my spotlight here. Would they know not to kill them? Oh. And lie right down, right in front of us. Very close to the vehicle. So, Robin, that is a very valid and good point. It is possible that the Birminghams might still kill some of their own cubs. It does happen from time to time. Uh, but fingers crossed, that instinct takes over, and they don't do that. Still very warm and humid. And you can see we are being attacked 
by the termites, alates. And uh, as you can see, the longer we hold the light, the more termites are going to get there. Fortunately, they don't bite, they just tickle a little. And you can see she tried to grab one there. There we go, look, look. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> look at that. She's just picking up on the movement. So Kathleen's noted how big her shoulders are, and the front part of that line is where all the power is. Oh, those massive shoulders. Oh, <laughs> oh, bless you. Turn white nickel. Oh, there we got another lioness up on the move. Now she's going to come say hello to this one. Is she? Yes, and she's often there to rub faces. There we go. And now this is a good sign that they might get moving. Uh, what they're doing now is called aloe grooming and a very important part of lion pride prides uh, it's to reinforce those pride bonds because quite often when they're feeding they forget all about being friendly so guys i'm just going to move the car a little bit so we don't have this radio aerial in the way Go to James quickly. He's got a hunting amphibian. Right, everybody, we found another. Look at that. Isn't that brilliant? That, in fact, I'm going to stay right here. That's a bushfield rain frog, everybody. He's about, mm, I'd say, about a quarter the size of that bullfrog, and he's just devoured himself an enormous termite. He looks, of course, as though he has had several hundred today. A very corpulent fellow. That's just what they look like. They look like very round, fat frogs. Look at him walking. <laughs> Got him. Oh, that's wonderful. You see how he lifts his backside in order to swallow? Oh, we've seen another one. I mean, you can't believe something that fat is able to move. Yeah, he spotted it. Go on, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe you can hear all the wings coming through the microphone of the flying termites. And in the background, you can hear a call of a frog. I'm not sure which frog that is. That might actually be the call of the Bushfield rain frog. It is. All right, let's head back to the lionesses for now. They are grooming. Uh, we're going to sit here for a little bit longer and try and identify a few of the calls that we can hear. So there we go. We just moved around so we can see them grooming nicely. And as I just said, very important part of lion pride behavior. Just reaffirming those bonds. Uh, sometimes it can get a bit heated around the kill. So occasionally, they just need a good little loving session. This is amazing. We're sitting here in the dark in the African bush alive with a pride of lions. So Jay in Wellington is a little bit about confused about when we shine lights and when we don't. Okay, so Jay will run through the nocturnal viewing rules. Jay, we don't shine on diurnal animals. So zebra, giraffe, and parlor, all the antelope species mostly. Their eyes are adapted for mostly being out and about during the day, and a spotlight at night can blind them a little bit. Uh, nocturnal animals' eyes work very differently. So as you can see, the light, they can look straight into the lights, and that doesn't bother them in the slightest. There we go. Okay, to go say hello to the next one. 
or not, we'll keep walking past. And we have a little pool clean, and you can see that wonderful... Sorry, I just need to move my little torch there. There we go. Um, there we go. The urination. So the thing that happens is, uh, Jay, so we shine spotlights on nocturnal animals. Now, there are certain t times when we don't shine spotlights on nocturnal animals. So there are, when there are baby, babies under a year, then we don't shine lights on them at all. Um, or well, actually under six months, it just depends on the species. And then the other time we switch off all our lights is when the animals are hunting. And that's so we don't blind the prey they're hunting or give away their position. So Jay, I hope that helps explain a little bit about when and when we don't use lights. Let's move around those other two girls look like they're having a really nice little grooming session and I think this third is on her way. Oh, they're on the move. Hopefully heading straight towards that water hole we were talking about. something really exciting and primal about following lions in the dark. What's that, Vian? No, there's two still behind us. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Look at her cleaning her claws. And you can see that power. Oh, I think she thought there might be a game up. One of her sisters was stalking her. Didn't want to be caught unawares. just about to appear out of the darkness to our left into the light. Another lioness. Beautiful girls. And the third right next to him. Huge Safari Live welcome to Mr. Dog, who's a brand new viewer on YouTube and says this is absolutely amazing. I agree, and welcome to the Safari Live family. So they're moving through. I really hope we're going to actually get them having a drink. But lions being lions, they might just move a little bit and then flop flat down on their bellies again. They are going through quite a thick little section. I'm going to try to shoot around them. This is the, they are, it looks like they're beelining straight for that little water hole. You can just actually hear them sneezing there. <laughs> so they are still en route. There's a very steep little drainage system in there, and I'm hoping we don't get the water in there, so I'm just going to check here quickly. There they are. Okay, no, they're still coming. You see their eyes coming through there. There they are. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure we don't lose them.
there's this little little start of a little creek in front of me. Okay, I still see them there. We don't want to go through there. We might get. That no, we'll be fine. Famous last words. Oh, we'll be fine. And then I have to beg James to come pull me out, and that I will never look down. James has found another interesting little inhabitant while we try to find these lions again. So we're just on the same road, everyone, and that is a ground beetle that is also, I think, eating termites, although the last time we saw this voracious predatory beetle, it wasn't eating the termites, it was eating these cockroaches that had come out rather at the same time as the termites had. You can see he's not quite as adept at it as that little bushveld rain frog was. Genre, if can I ask you to just go to the back, just behind him? Um, yeah, I'm just walking away there. You can see on the top of the screen there. Now, that's two termites that have found love. They've shed their wings, and they're now in the process of mating. And with any luck, they will start a new mound fairly soon that will eventually become where well, they're not... These aren't the fungus-growing termites, so they won't build... They, look, look, he's caught one. He's caught one. Look at that. A live kill. And he's got vicious mandibles on the front of his face that he's stuck into the abdomen of that termite. The termite will be struggling. No termite mound building for that one. Oh, isn't that amazing? And ground beetle, of course, probably won't eat anything like the number. There are some lovers in the front, top left of your screen, you can see them. And like I say, these are not the, the termite mound building ones. I think these are harvesters or odontotermies. And so they will build a mound, but it will be largely subterranean. See, his ground beetle has shed the wings off. This, with that super zoom, would be unbelievable, wouldn't it, Jandri? You see him just eating off the head there. And if you've ever wondered where or how so many of the pictures of aliens in the films come from, well, there you are. Certainly, if you've ever seen District 9, that's precisely what the front of their faces looked like. See, there are two species of termites now. There, he's trying to catch another one. He just got beaten in the head by mistake. That's a fungus-growing termite. Those little ones are the ones that make the big mounds. This is just fantastic. It is quite astonishing. Look at the light shining off that beetle's eye. All right, everybody, that's it from us today. Uh, we're going to hand you back to the lions for the last few minutes of the drive. Thank you, Jean-André, for your efforts today. Good job. Uh, I apologize for mine. Uh, thank you very much, of course, to the final control of Geraldine Cheesecake Kent and Louise Pavid. We're going to hand you back to Brent Leo Smith and the diminutive but highly competent Viam Dorenbrach and the lions for the rest of the drive. We'll see you tomorrow at dawn. Bye-bye. So, of course, uh, animals like to keep you on your toes. So the lions just decided the hatch proved me wrong. Viam and I rushed to wait at the waterhole, and we could see the lions from the waterhole. They looked at the waterhole and lay down. But that's one of the things about being out in the bush and it being live. We can't control what the animals are going to do. And we can't catch or edit what's happening. So it is nature at its most pure live wherever you are from the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. Go. I'm pretty sure they still are going to go drink at the same little water hole. Of course, just not when we wanted them to. So, really great news. As I said, looking at them, it looks like all three are actually pregnant. Oh, I heard that too, Lion. 
You're an impala. Snorting in the distance. And so did she. Sunny just saw her ears pick up. But quite far away, not too interested. Now, what we've seen here is this very typical lion behavior. Get up, stretch, walk for a little bit, lie down. The lions sleep on average for about 20 hours a day and are only up and moving for four hours. And even then, it's in small little bursts of movement rather than long bursts of movement. It's not to say that they can't. They just generally choose not to. Oh, there we go. We've got a bit of a, a walk on. Maybe we will get that amazing drinking shot before the end of the safari. And up they come. Now, this line, oh, I was hoping she was going to walk right next to me. I'm just going to let them walk past before we try and get round to the water hole. Look how close they are to us. Who's oh, coming to say hello to VM? So she's about less than a foot from VM as she does that. Isn't that incredible, guys? I know VM loves it. The smile on his face is from ear to ear. That is awesome. What we got next one? Oh, VM, she doesn't like you as much as the other. Oh. Oh, let's see what they're up to. Oops. I have to go backwards. just to the left here. Yeah. Obviously, they've had a good drink at some point. And I think they might move on towards maybe even quarantine. And we're at the junction of Philemon's cut line. That road there leads directly to quarantine. Look at that. There is a, ooh, a little stand book. Light off. And that stand book looks like it knows the lions are there. And yes, lions are probably not going to try and catch a stand book. It's not really worth their while. And the little stand book, he, he knows it. And he spotted those lines way before we spotted him. Okay. Let's go around them for a last treat before the end of the safari. There we go. So it looks like they're heading off slightly into the bush, into a very, very thick block. And I think I'm going to let the ladies carry on with their hunting from here. But wonderful to see them up and on the move, and nice of them to prove me wrong. I was really hoping they were going to stop off for a drink at that little pan. But alas, one of those things. So thanks for joining James and I on the Sunset Safari. Uh, it was lots of fun, and hopefully there'll be lots of cats out again tomorrow. Today def definitely lived up to the cat day. Uh, we saw the Karula this morning and the Styx Lionesses both this morning and this evening. And also great news, uh, the Juma Dam Cam is back up rational, so keep watching that. And don't forget to join us for the Sunrise Safari for more exciting stories live from the African bush.